This is Greg Remke with part two of Economics of Federal Transportation Infrastructure. We finished the last session uh, discussing scarcity, choice, and opportunity cost, key economic concepts for any aspect of the economy, and we applied those to uh, transportation policy. So the cost of a new highway or railway or airport or new spending on uh, uh, port security it's not just the money cost, but the opportunities foregone. It's what we give up to spend more money in those things. Now, it's important to realize that the labor to build a highway, the jobs created, are a cost, not a benefit. Uh, obviously, people who get those jobs uh, prefer them. Either they were unemployed or they came from a different job and preferred to work on the highway or the pay was higher. But Often uh, politicians talk about new spending programs as if the jobs are a benefit in and of themselves. The, it's key to understand the benefit is in the value created by the job, not just the work. You could hire every unemployed person in the country by paying them to go out and dig holes in the ground and fill them up. Uh, you could have them make little roads. They could um, get dirt, gravel, put it someplace and put asphalt on the top and everyone would be working. But that's only a value if the road built, if the work done has, creates value, cre is something that uh, uh, is good for society, is good for people who are willing to pay for it. So in reality, um, creating jobs, shovel-ready jobs in the transportation industry, the road industry, is pulling people away again from other occupations about, and pulling resources away, pulling capital away, pulling machinery away, and so the hope is that what they're doing in building new roads is better for the investors, better for society than what they would have been doing otherwise. Again, the job's not the benefit, it's what is created with the job that's the benefit. It's worth mentioning other economic aspects of transportation of roads is that the noise and the air pollution from cars on roads, railroads, airports are costs that are imposed on others. These are externalities costs that are often not compensated. So when a new highway goes in and there's a roar of traffic on that highway, the people that have to put up with that noise should be compensated. Now maybe there's some compensation being close to a highway and so forth in terms of value for commercial real estate, but in general you want a system where air pollution, noise pollution, other costs from business enterprises are um, compensated, they're not forced upon people against their will. But again, externality is a little tricky concept. I mean, anybody that lives near a house full of kids has the externality of the kids screaming and making noise. So you can't have a blanket, all noise gets compensated. But I just mentioned that as a economic aspects of highways. Highways and railway spending has benefits, of course, and the key benefits are lowering transportation costs as well as improved safety. So new railways that can carry oil uh, across the country or coal or coal slurry, those uh, rail lines allow energy to get from where it's dug out of the ground or piped out of the ground to people that use it, whether that's a railroad or whether it's shipped in trucks or whether it's through a pipeline, those are all substitutable transportation technologies. Uh, the benefit is lower energy costs, uh, companies being able to maneuver to send oil and coal where it's needed most. For a company, again, uh, being able to get parts delivered more quickly, less expensively is a benefit to the company, allows U.S. companies to be more competitive with those overseas. Improved safety is a key issue for this topic, and I know in the public school world, a lot of students were excited about the cases that involve improving safety. Lots of people die on the highways. You, you can look up the numbers. It's a, a huge tragedy. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of commotion about killing uh, with guns and mass murderers, but far more people die on highways. And that's because the highways aren't designed as safely as they could be. Um, just uh, dividing highways. I remember in Texas, lots of highways that, you know, cars are going past each other 40, 50, 60 miles an hour in the opposite direction. One mistake and people are injured or die. A divided highway is much safer, uh, much less likely to have those kinds of accidents. So when you spend money to improve highways, to divide them, uh, to put um, uh, barriers between the oncoming lanes, that saves lives. Similarly, much less expensively, new white paint 
turns out uh, to save lives. It makes it easier to, to stay in your own side. So there's lots of uh, technologies that could improve highway safety as well as just building and expanding lanes. So one theme in the way economists look at transportation issues is to have uh, highways, railways, um, um, uh, airports paid for by the people who use them. All these things have costs and economists like it when the people who use the service pay the cost. That's the way uh, banana technology, uh, banana services work in the country. Bananas are grown in Costa Rica or Brazil. They're shipped, they're picked, they're shipped to the ports, they're loaded on boats, they're shipped to the U.S., they're trucked or railed to people. And that whole transportation cost for bananas is paid for by the people who consume bananas, or at least it should be. It makes sense for the people who use the good or service to pay for it. That's the just way to do it, and it's the most efficient way to do it in terms of incentives in a market economy. So why not have a system where the people who drive on the highway pay for the highway? The people who fly in airplanes or use the airport pay for the airport. So you can have ticket fees that pay for the airport services. You can have um, gas taxes that pay for people. So when you buy a gallon of gas, you pay a tax on that. That tax goes to pay for the highway. You can have some freeways have tolls on them so that people that use them pay for them. Those that, for example, can't be supported by the gas taxes. So again, you're, you're looking for an overall ideal system or a system that works is one that just makes the road system that the government runs work like private systems where the people who use it pay for it, or at least that's the ideal. A user pay system appeals to our sense of justice and creates healthy incentives. Road builders under this system have an incentive to build roads where people want to use them, and the same with light rail or bicycle trails. Uh, if you have a system where the people who pay for it, use it, it works better. Have I said that before? Yes, thank you. Okay, moving on. Uh, we have a transportation knowledge problem. A free economy is consumer driven, the consumer choices drive production, but the producers of roads, highways, railroads don't, can't know exactly where consumers want the roads or new rail capacity or new airports. So you want uh, you have to have a discovery process where entrepreneurs are trying to figure this out. The challenge with the government, state or federal government, building these roads is that they have political motivations to do it. And those may or may not be the right places to build roads. They may want to build like a fair amount of the freeway systems and airports are built where somebody with political neck connections owns the land. So they get the huge benefit of their land being purchased and the rest of their land being far more expensive because it's near the new highway or airport. You would prefer to have a system that doesn't have those opportunities for self-dealing or corruption or whatever you might call it. Road builders have to discover where to build them. And again, that's a that's a risk process, but you'd want the people to make to take those uh, risks who have a good incentive to put them in the right place. Another aspect of it, um, you can't pay for the whole highway right when you build it, or that is to say, the value of a highway comes over the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, but the costs are incurred right now in building it. So how do you finance a highway? Well, you can issue bonds that are paid for by um, tolls, people who use the highway. The government sort of does it in a way that they spend the money on it and then they get revenue from gas taxes, and that's an alternative. But the idea is you've got to uh, uh, spend, do the spending today, which is an investment, and pay for it in the future. If you build it in the wrong place or the wrong kind of infrastructure, then it's not going to get paid for in the future, and the, either the government is stuck with the road or the airport that's unused. Airports are a good example. There's empty airports around the country that are built in particular congressional districts for political reasons. They're not well used. Uh, uh, Pennsylvania is an example for some of these, so, so it's, a, it's a waste or a misuse of scarce taxpayers' dollars. Um, Wimpy here with his hamburger, he's the more in consumer goods rather than investment goods. He is saying, as I you know, gladly pay for a hamburger today, tomorrow, um, and maybe slightly different hamburger on Tuesday, pay on Wednesday. In any case, uh, uh, 
you can spend money in the present by pulling assets from the future if you invest in, in an asset that creates value. So what's the best way to make a hamburger? We don't know. Uh, instead, we have dozens, hundreds of companies that are searching for better ways to make a hamburger. I mentioned the searching process in the sense that investors have to figure out where to build federal infrastructure and what kind to build. But there's really more options in infrastructure than, than just a road or a highway. I mean, there's light rail, there's heavy rail, but there's other options as well. Entrepreneurs are searching for solutions for goods and services people are going to pay for. So we want entrepreneurs to innovate, to find new ways to use assets more efficiently. So if your question is, what's the best way to transport people from home to work and back? Uh, well, roads do that now, or light rail can do that, or subways. However, what if that's the wrong question? What if you can transport people via electrons to work? Not a transporter, but what if you've got a Skype video conference where people at home are in an office where they can be seen uh, by video? or three-dimensional hologram. So you don't know if the person's actually sitting in his office or not until you swipe your hand through them. And if they're there, of course, you've, you've, you've whacked them. Uh, in any case, the, uh, the, we want to look for new ways to solve the transportation problem. But for example, uh, in shipping goods and getting people to work, there's many, many options that people haven't, uh, don't often discuss. So let's, look, so let's look at the cost of congestion first. Some $200 billion wasted annually um, in transportation delays for freight. The picture on the right is one from China as the trucks are jammed up waiting to get to port. The one on the left is uh, um, a highway in the United States jammed up at rush hour. Uh, this is a lot of money wasted on this, and I'll come to how, how you can fund new roads, again, without, uh, without a net cost. Some $70 billion of fuel are wasted each year as cars are stopping and going at 5, 10, 15, 20 miles an hour instead of going at 55 or 60. Uh, that stopping and going is wear and tear on the cars and is wasting fuel. So by fixing the system so it works, you can save $270 billion simply by having freeways that are properly managed. So it's true it costs money to build new highway capacity, but Here's $270 billion a year that are available to fund that increase in capacity or increase in technology that improves management. What's the best solution to this? Well, a challenge is for the affirmative, um, you're sort of pretending in debate that you're the congressman offering the solution to the world, but in fact, you can't know the solution. Congress doesn't know the solution. Nobody knows the solution. Instead, the solution is one that's discovered that emerges through the interaction of hundreds, thousands of entrepreneurs with ideas and investments, millions of customers, um, uh, tr transport people making decisions about where they want to go and how they're going to adjust their lives, shipping people, uh, purchasing agents. That whole adjustment process is managed throughout the economy on the basis of prices and markets because prices communicate information between people buying services, people producing them. In transportation, we've got a problem. We don't have flexible prices. Highways are free. That's why they're jammed at rush hour every day. If you had a way to adjust prices, a way to use prices to communicate information, you could better deal with this. So again, the planners versus the searchers. William Easterly uh, uses this model in his book, uh, White Man's Burden, that's discussing the problems in foreign aid. Market economies and market sectors of the US economy have searchers trying to solve problems, the computer industry, tech industry, TV industry. But we also have sections that are top-down planned by federal transportation agencies, the Department of Transportation, state agencies. These city, state, and federal agencies are trying to plan from the top down how to solve transportation congestion, uh, but they have they don't have access to the information that would allow them uh, would allow those uh, solutions to emerge. This is the ideas that uh, Friedrich Hayek talks about in uh, Use of Knowledge in Society, and Leonard Reed discusses in his book I Pencil, and I'll maybe have a separate box to discuss that. 
Now, let's talk about where the money can come from. I mentioned the uh, hours and time wasted. Uh, 2011, an extra 4. billion hours on the road, according to transportation economists, Texas Transportation Institute. Uh, 1.9 billion more gallons of gas because of congestion. So congestion costs in this measure are $101 billion. If you think about this in terms of traffic jams, I have I met a fellow who lives in uh, Federal Way. He uh, um, commuted to Linwood every day uh, for his work. It was an hour each day, each way. So he spent two hours on the road. Uh, one hour of that was congestion. That is to say, if the freeways worked going at 45 to 60 miles an hour, he would have got to work in a half hour and would have got home in a half hour. Instead, because so many people are on the highway at the same time, uh, he's an hour getting to work, an hour back. So that's an hour lost every day, and he's stuck in traffic, plus the gas with stop-and-go traffic. Now, if you think about the proposal that says, okay, we're going to put a toll on the freeway and charge everyone $5.00, to drive to work in the morning and five dollars to drive home so that w would seem to cost him an extra you know ten dollars a day but if through paying that he was able to go full speed home and back he would save an hour so he, this guy was a Boeing engineer he would save an hour of time and pay ten dollars to do it that's a tremendous deal for him right because his time is working for Boeing he gets paid far more than ten dollars an hour he values his leisure at more than ten dollars an hour if he had the option to pay that he would as would millions of other Americans so in a sense every day that there's a traffic jam these are people who would be willing to pay money to get to work or to get home at rush hour but they're not allowed to because we don't have a system that allows prices to um, handle the demand for the product so that it's used efficiently. We have prices at the movie theater, right? More people want to go to the movies at Friday night and Saturday night. So how do theaters handle the fact that they've got scarce number of seats in their theater? Well, they charge higher prices. People that go to matinees on the weekdays and the afternoons, they pay significantly less. So the, the movie theater is dealing with a problem that though most people wanted to go to the movies in the evenings, there's only so many theater seats available. So they raise the prices at that time and they lower them at other times when people are less likely to want to go. But many people can change their plans. Similarly with the highway, 50%, 40% of the people that are on the highway at rush hour aren't going to work. They're on the highway for other reasons. There are lots of people that can change their driving patterns without great cost um, if there was an incentive to do that. Charging people to use the freeway when it's most valued uh, is one way to do that. And there, that's a big debate on that. This is the discussion over congestion pricing. And the argument is that you could reduce congestion delays, save hundreds of millions, billions of dollars a year, have more money to put into expand infrastructure simply by putting a price on uh, peak traffic time on the highway. Uh, population's gone up by some 80 million since 1982. A uh, lot more cars, some 124 million more cars on the highway uh, uh, than there used to be in uh, 1980 to 2008. So the question we ask is, have highway, has highway construction expanded to keep pace with the increase in highway customers? Or has light rail or subway expanded to keep pace of the increased population? And the answer is no. This has to do with a number of demographic changes. That is, the, the suburban population no longer commutes to the city for jobs each morning. Instead, most of the commutes in Los Angeles, Seattle, most cities, most western cities and southern cities are from an edge to another edge. So they're going around the, 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 the loops in the towns. They're not going from the outside to the center, which is why light rail and heavy rail and subway aren't uh, efficient uh, ways to deal with uh, transportation because people are spread out in the way they work. Anyway, more to that debate, but that's a brief note on it. So are there alternatives to the current status quo in terms of transportation? Well, here's some transportation alternatives. You may not know what those are right off. When we ask the question how to get people and goods and services from where they are produced to where they're wanted, 
Um, you know, I mentioned uh, meetings, teleconferencing, but maybe you could also send goods and people through pneumatic tubes. Uh, that's what Chicago used to do. Chicago had a system of pneumatic tubes that allowed, that connected the downtown buildings and people in any building could send a letter or a package to any other by putting it in a tube and it would, it would uh, zip along to another place. And this was before computers. This was mechanical systems that were uh, not efficient by our standards. You still see these in banks and a few other areas where people's deposit goes through a sort of a vacuum tube. But that technology is available uh, and could work in, in many ways. I'll come back to that. What about uh, shipping things by rail and freeway? We've got uh, trucks shipping stuff all over. Why not use Zeppelins instead? These are filled with uh, helium. Uh, they're, the technology is much more advanced. We see the Goodyear blimp you know, advertising, but Zeppelins could also uh, do a lot more to transport goods and services. Um, maybe you could even have buses run uh, uh, elevated. Uh, more to that story, the great story of the R100 and R101 debate on, on uh, travel is fascinating. But for here, I just mentioned that Zeppelins are, uh, I'm sure students, some students will be interested in the Zeppelin affirmative for uh, transportation infrastructure. Um, pneumatic tubes, uh, the London tube was the transportation system for sending people around London. You're basically, you're building a tunnel, a tube, and sending people along it. To what extent could that technology be revived and modernized in the computer world? If you think about the modern light rail systems, the New York subway, most of that technology is 100 years old. Uh, these are heavy systems that uh, are less than ideal. Here's a Zapata personal pneumatic tube pod that allows people to travel around the city. Uh, apparently you have to take your clothes off to travel in this, but the idea is you're zipping around a vacuum tube. It's got information, computers on it to move quickly, uh, much less uh, power involved. And so the question is how expensive would it be to build this kind of infrastructure compared to building more light rail or freeways or airports? Um, Students that have looked at these issues before have looked at uh, high-speed vacuum tubes for long-distance travel. Um, uh, Gerard K. O'Neill at uh, Princeton developed this uh, technology, at least the ideas of it, many years ago. But basically, it's 21 minutes to go from New York to Los Angeles through a vacuum uh, pneumatic tube. It'd be expensive to build, expensive to maintain, but you could send people rapidly and accelerate them smoothly so that they wouldn't be flattened like a pancake, but get them from one place to another uh, rapidly. This company, Article in the Futurist, says why use heavy cars and trucks to deliver goods? 90% of the energy is accelerating and breaking the truck and the car. Why not send goods through food tubes, through vacuum tubes underground? You can find this on their website. This is a little uh, uh, inexpensive video uh, deal, the animation that just shows their system. This is mainly an environmental group claiming, look, this is going to reduce CO2 emissions and so forth. And whether that's a big deal, I can't say. But the idea is this: these tubes, it might, it's much less expensive to tunnel than it used to be. If you look at the incredible advances that the shale, uh, shale gas uh, uh, drilling has done, it's lowered the cost of rapidly drilling small tunnels uh, dramatically uh, over just in the last 10 years. Maybe this uh, horizontal drilling technology could be used for drilling tubes that are filled out with uh, uh, these vacuum tubes and then instead of having all these trucks on the highway, uh, goods can be delivered quickly from one part of the city to another. So this is a proposal for one uh, section in uh, part of London, 130 households could be connected with these tubes, they argue, and uh, save money, save energy, and so forth. Is this a good idea? Who knows? You'd rather have uh, investors uh, developing this and see how it, you know, get the bugs out of it before, uh, uh, before it's deployed in big expense. Taco Copter is another technology. Basically, you order a taco with your smartphone. It comes in a little hovercraft and is dropped off at your front door. Again, it's uh, lowering transportation costs. You don't have to go out and get your tacos. They are flown to you rapidly. The East Coast has lobster copter, which is supposed to be a similar technology. Not perfect, but again, an alternative to the status quo. Okay, uh, let me stop here and 
we'll get on to the history part in the next section